Hey Docs, I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, things are looking up. We might be getting to meet with each other pretty soon. Uh, the next couple weeks or so. Looking forward to it. Uh, anyways, hopefully you guys are doing well. Hopefully uh, you guys are enjoying the beginning parts of your summer now that things are opening back up. So anyways, uh, we're continuing our, our study today in Micah. We're in Micah chapter 5 uh, verses 7 through 15. So we'll finish the rest of the chapter for uh, Micah 5. So hopefully you guys have been following along and um, hopefully you guys are enjoying this time. So anyways, the title for today's um, teaching is basically the wrath of God against his enemies. So last week we talked about how God is going to punish his people using the nation of Assyria. So hopefully you guys are getting the the uh, story of the Old Testament. This is this is the story. Okay, Israel has sinned and has abandoned the God the God that has saved them. Remember back in Egypt. And now God is going to punish his people for their disobedience. God is a God of judgment, and he judges his people, and they have sinned. And so it, it, it's consistent with his character to punish his people. Okay, Assyria is going to come and wipe out Israel, but Assyria is not going to get the last word, right? All the nations and Assyria will be punished. They will be judged, and they will be crushed. God is not, you know, we understand this, God is not just going to destroy everyone. He's not just going to wipe out the whole world. We understand that. A Savior has been promised, and this promise has been gone back to Genesis 3.15, but also this, this Savior has been promised since the beginning of time. A shepherd is going to come and rescue his people, and the shepherd's going to kind of save his people and, and kind of do two things. The Savior's going to come and save first, He's going to save us from our sins. And then second, he's going to save us from our enemies at the end of the time. So let's look at our text real quick. Micah 5, 7. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which delay not for man, nor wait for the children of man. God is, is first of all, going to save his people. He has chosen a, a remnant, a, a select few people. The remnant of God is a, is a chosen select few from the world who God has decided to save. Okay? Not everyone in Israel is part of Israel. So God has chosen to save some from, from Israel, and not all of Israel is of Israel. Okay, So when we find that out in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. But it is not as though the world of God, or the word of God, has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because uh, they are his offspring. So not all of Israel is Israel. Who what makes you Israel isn't the fact that you you come from Abraham necessarily, right? The people of Israel are made up of of two different types of people. So you've got the physical Israel and you've got a spiritual Israel. Okay, Physical Israel are those who are descendants of Abraham, but they're part of Israel, but they have turned away from, from Yahweh. Okay, Their allegiance is elsewhere. However, spiritual Israel are those who have faith in a coming Savior. They're the ones who have faith in the coming Savior who love Yahweh with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And they have devoted their lives to the worship of Yahweh. From this remnant is one who will come who will be a Savior. So God has chosen a select few, and from this select few, the Savior is going to come. And there's also two remnants here uh, when we look at our text. So there are two remnants. There's the immediate remnant and then the future remnant. There will be a pe there there is a, a people set apart by Yahweh who will be saved and who are kept alive and they're going to be a blessing to the nations. This remnant is is in a sense the immediate context. These are the people of ancient Israel. There's a remnant of ancient Israel and there's going to be a, a latter day remnant. Okay? But also there's a there's a future a latter day remnant, a select few from the world who God is going to save in order to be a blessing to the nations as well. The phrase, and in that day, in verse 10, kind of tips us off to kind of what he's talking about. So, it, in that day kind of tips us off that the Lord is speaking about the end of the age, or the, the latter days. At the end of the age, this remnant will be a mist to the nations. He will be a blessing to the nations. So, Micah's kind of setting up a contrast here. The remnant will rule and have victory over its adversaries. 
Okay, but however, we find that in Micah 4, chapter 6 and 7, that this is, that the remnant is kind of a, a sick and a lame people. Okay, let's look at this text real quick in, in Micah. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and I will, and those who were afflicted. And the lame I will make the remnant and those who were cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. So it seems as though this remnant people is going to rule over the world, but also they're lame and they're weak. So let's look at this text, 1 Corinthians 1.27. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Okay, so the weak in the world, God chose what is weak in the world in order to be a mist to the nations, in order to be, to, in, in, on one sense, to shame the strong, but also to, to be a mist and a blessing to the nations, okay? So the weak are going to be a great mist, a great blessing. Uh, let's also look at this text in Genesis 27, 28. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine, let people serve you and the nations bow down to you. Be Lord of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you. Blessed everyone who blesses you. So this is the idea here. Jacob has been blessed by the Lord. He's been blessed by the Lord and, and, and Israel and Jacob are supposed to be, to be, in a sense, an extension of God's blessing to the world. They're to extend God's blessing to the world. This idea continues in, in our text. The weak remnant of God is called to be a blessing to the world, to, called to be a dew to the world. It's kind of like, think of this picture, you're out in the desert and you're parched, right? And all of a sudden, you know, and there's never been a rain before, but all of a sudden this rain comes down and you open up your mouth and you're just taking it all in. That's, that's what Israel is supposed to be. And that's what this end time remnant is all supposed to be. This weak remnant of God is to be a blessing to the world. The main idea, the main blessing that, that we should have in mind is that this remnant has been given the gospel. This remnant has been blessed by Christ, and they've been blessed by Christ by receiving the gospel. And then they're to give the gospel. They've been saved now, and they must extend this blessing to the world. This remnant is supposed to extend this blessing to the world. So those who have faith in Christ are counted as sons of Abraham, okay? So as as Jacob uh, and all of Israel are supposed to be a blessing to the nations, if you have faith in Christ, if you have faith in the coming Savior, you are counted as an Israelite. You are counted as a son of Abraham, okay? They, if you have faith in Christ, you are counted as a latter-day remnant, the latter-day Israel. So let's look at this, Galatians 3, 7 through 9. Now then, now then, that it is, those of faith who are the sons of Abraham and the scripture for seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying in you shall all the nations be blessed so then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham the man of faith Abraham was the man of faith who had faith in the coming Savior and he received the blessing of salvation. He used to extend that same blessing out to the world. So if you have faith in Christ alone, if you have faith in Christ, you are a son of Abraham, a son of Jacob. You are part of the remnant Israel, part of the latter-day remnant. The, the blessing that was extended to the remnant, to us, it comes unexpectedly. We weren't expecting to be, to be rescued. It, it waited for no one. It didn't wait for us. It just came and, and grabbed us. The gospel just grabs us. And no one has power over the blessing of the gospel. It just comes. God uses the gospel message to rescue his people. God uses the message to cause salvation. And it's irrevocable. Let's look at verse 8. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations, in the midst of many people, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which, when it goes through, treads down and tears in pieces, and there is none to deliver. The remnant of God is going to be a powerful people with the shepherd, by the grace of the shepherd. The remnant of Israel, the spiritual end-time remnant of God, will rule like a lion in the power of the Lord. 
The idea here is that this remnant of God will ravage, ravage its enemies, ravage the enemies of God. This weak and lame people will be strengthened in the power of the Lord to exercise judgment over its enemies. Satan and his minions will be destroyed, and the remnant lion will be over its adversaries. There is no escape from the Lord's judgment. In verses 9 through 10, God's people will, in a sense, have a high standing over the enemies of God. Here we see that in that day, again, in verse 10, and it's reminding us that God is talking about the end of history. God is going to destroy the offensive powers of his enemies. So in war, right now we're talking about God is going to destroy the offensive power of his enemies. Let's look at verse 9. Your hand shall be lifted up over your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. And in that day, declares the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots. So the, the offensive efforts of the enemy comes from the horses and the chariots. That kind of gives them their power. But God is going to destroy the, his enemies and their means to do battle. Horses and chariots were, were, in a sense, the means that the enemy would use to do battle. And God is going to destroy them. In the end, God will dismantle the devil and his powers. He will dismantle all of his enemies and their, and their power. And he will crush them utterly. In verse 11, God will dismantle his also his enemy's defenses. So his the enemy's offensive and now the defensive. So all of God's enemies and their strongholds will be thrown down. There will be no place to hide and no place to find protection. That's what you get with defenses. You can hide behind them. You can find protection behind your defenses. You're not trying to attack. You're defending. But God is also going to destroy the defenses. If you don't trust in Christ alone, you have nowhere to hide. God sees all. He knows where you are. He's going to shower you with his wrath. If you do not repent and trust in Christ for the forgiveness of sins, you will endure the wrath of God. There is no defense against his wrath, no power against his wrath. Okay, verse 11, it's just such a, a strong text. And I will cut off the, the cities of your land and throw down all of your strongholds. God's wrath and his destruction will crush his enemies and, and there will be no more defenses. No stone will be left unturned. All of its defenses that the enemies has will be destroyed, will be crushed. In verse 12, God will move his wrath. He kind of moves his wrath now towards false worship, right? So let's look at verse uh, verse 12. And I will cut off sorceries from your hand, and you shall, ha and you shall have no more tellers of, of fortunes. In Exodus and in Leviticus, cultic practices were not allowed, right? It angers the Lord when someone uh, looks for a fortune teller and asks for their fortunes to be to be told. We find this all throughout the, the history of Israel, that someone went to go to a fortune teller to see if they'd win a battle, and they, they end up losing the battle, and, and the Lord cursed them. It angers the Lord when you, when you go do cultic pra practices and, and practice sorcery. God's wrath is reserved for those who worship God in the wrong ways. If you worship God as if he's just some common deity, you will suffer his wrath. God is not like any other God. Okay, in verse 13, God will actively destroy carved images and he will actively destroy people who practice false worship. So let's look at verse 13. And I will cut off your carved images and your pillars from, a lot, from among you, and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands. These are these are idols that have been that have been created by the the works of man. These false gods were were given to them by the outside nations. Israel was supposed to be a mirror to the world for who Yahweh is. The the world should be able to look in and see the the beauty of God and the love of God, the justice of God, and the way that Israel, the Israelites acted. They were supposed to be a representative of God. Instead, they wanted to be like the outside nations. They forgot about their God and they created new ones in the hopes that they, you know, they might be more successful and find a happy life. They made other gods and God is angered by this. Yahweh rescued his people from Egypt. He covenanted with Israel. God claims Israel as his bride and then Israel goes after another bridegroom. Since God is a judge and he will rightly judge and destroy all of his enemies, 
He is angered, and he is going to do that. He is going to crush them. In our time, if we do not bow the knee to God, if we do not worship God as he commands, his wrath will be hot against us without Christ. One of the false images is, is kind of called out by name in verse 14. And I will root out your Asherah images from among you and destroy your cities. God is going to destroy their cities. He's going to destroy all of the images. Okay, so the Asherah is, is kind of a, is a fertility god. This idol would have come kind of from a tree and they would have worshipped it, hoping for better crops, for children, whatever that looks like. God is angered at, at these images and he has hot anger against his enemies. Let's look at verse 15. And in anger and wrath I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. So God's anger is not just against Israel. God's anger, anger is not just against Assyria, but against the whole world. All the nations have sinned and worshiped God wrongly. God's wrath will crush his enemies. But if you trust in Christ, our shepherd, his wrath will be placed on his son. So wrath will come either on the non-believer, the enemy of God, or it will come upon Christ. And we naturally don't like to talk about God's wrath. We naturally don't like to think of God as, as holy as he is. We like to downplay God's holiness, and we like to downplay our sin. The minor prophets wake us up to, the, to God's anger and the holiness of God. We need our eyes opened to, to God's holiness and the wrath of God. Okay, He will have vengeance on sin, either on his enemies or he will place it on his son for us. So, Docs, I, I plead with you guys to trust in Christ for the forgiveness of sins, that you might find salvation, that his anger and wrath would be adverted to his son than on you. So, find your hope in him. Trust in him for everything. I pray that God would be, would be made beautiful to you, that he would arrest you to him, because we naturally love ourselves more than anything else. I pray that the Lord would would open your eyes and your hearts so that you might see him as more valuable and more worthy than anything. Anyways, Doc, so love you. See you next week where we will talk about Micah chapter 6. My Lord, I did not choose you For that could never be My heart would still refuse you Had you not chosen me You took the sin that stayed me, made me new. Of old you have ordained me, that I should live in you. My Lord, I did not choose you, for that could never be. My heart would still refuse you, had you not chosen Your grace had called me and taught my opening mind. The world would have been for me to help me glory is blind. My Lord, I did not choose you, for that could never be. My heart would still refuse you, had you not chosen. Chosen.